Hi, my name is James Sanderson. I'm the evangelism minister here at the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. Great to have you with us today as we are continuing our series in the book of Romans. Hey, I want to tell you, last night um, when I taught this class um, in the auditorium here in Waxahachie, boy, it was a rough night. Uh, it wasn't long after that, and we had some uh, tornadoes come through. Um, it, uh, it spared us here in Waxahachie. Uh, went around us, but there was some damage on both ends uh, around us, and uh, it was kind of scary at, at, for a moment, for sure. But God was good, and he took care of us, and we're thankful for that. Uh, I'm still trying to get used to these tornadoes, uh, being a Michigan guy, right? Um, right, got my Michigan shirt on today. Um, I'm used to blizzards and what whiteouts from snow, but tornadoes, not that familiar with. Uh, but hey, it's just a different world down here. Well, hey, let's get started today. Glad you're with us. We I'm going to entitle this lesson today, Trusting God and that the Gospel is Good Enough. This lesson really has to do with trust. Do you as a Christian have a hard time trusting God? Just be honest. Well, I do. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to trust God, isn't it? Especially living in this world, as chaotic as it is. That's what Paul's going to talk about today. We're going to get into politics. We're going to get into the Caesars. This lesson will stretch you. I've already had one person come and say, that lesson was hard to swallow, swallow last night, James. I get it. I get it. And you know what? I'm just a person too. And I deal with these things. So we're all in it together, aren't we? This is lesson number 24, chapter 13. We are going to go through the entire chapter 13 today in this lesson. So let's get started. I always like to do this, and I think it's important, especially today for this lesson. Try to put yourself in the, the shoes of this people that this letter was written to. And who's it written to? Christians living where? That's right. Smack dab in the middle of the Roman Empire, the capital city, Rome. And what do these people go through? Well, one of the things they go through is persecution. That's right. Okay. They will be persecuted as Christians. This is a picture. The second picture here is a picture of the Colosseum. And this is a group of Christians who are who refuse to follow Caesar and, and denounce uh, uh, Christianity or Jesus. And because of that, they are going to be used as a sport. And they will let the lions in and they will tear them limb to limb. Yes, persecution. Now, this this was not happening yet to Christians. The Colosseum will probably not be written. Or built until about 81 uh, AD, which is about probably about 15 years after this book of Romans is written. But they were being persecuted even at this time. And that's the world they lived in. It was hard to be a Christian in the Roman world. And it's going to get worse. What else do they have? Caesar worship. You can see these people bowing down to Caesar. That's a lot of pressure on a Christian because Christians don't worship um, anybody else but Jesus. And then what else goes on in their world? There's taxation. And just like us, do we have a hard time paying our bills? Exactly. Do we ask questions about taxes and things? Absolutely. We sure do. And there's a Roman guard making sure they're going to pay. So this is the world they lived in, a difficult world. But, you know, if you really think about it, it's much like our world today, too. All those things apply to us. What was Paul's purpose of writing this letter? Don't forget about it. He's bringing them the gospel. That's what Romans chapter 1, verse 14 and set through 17 says. So don't forget, as you're going through this lesson today, to realize he is bringing them the gospel 
good news. The gospel is going to connect to this chapter. Okay, don't don't forget that. And don't forget who's at the church in Rome. They're made up of lots of different people. Jews and Gentiles. With their backgrounds. Well, if you were here in Waxahachie, the church is made up of Yankees. That's what they call me. Some from the north. And southerners. Okay? So, again, different backgrounds. Different ways of thinking. Different people. Male and female, rich and poor, no different here than when it walks a hatchet. So there's this church made up of all these different groups of people dealing with all these different things right smack in the middle of Rome. And what did we see last week? What does the gospel push them to do? It pushes a person to learn to serve one another. Through that gospel. So just think of all the things that the gospel did to bring you Jesus, to get you into his kingdom. A lot went on for that to happen. And now God is demanding that because of that, now you're in his kingdom, that you learn how to serve one another. And so what do we see back in chapter 12? Well, this is one of the verses we saw. Don't repay anyone evil for evil. Don't treat each other like that. Have you ever wanted to get revenge? Even on somebody within the church? Sure. How did it work for you? When you actually did it, did it really fix everything? Never does, does it? So don't repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in everybody's eyes. He's trying to get the church to love each other. Love those in the church. Love those outside the church. The gospel will move you and it's a motivator for you to love people because that's what the gospel does. It loved us enough that God came down and died for us. Okay? So that's what we learned last week. And I brought this picture up last week. Do you remember this? We pay no one evil for evil. Right? So when I was teaching this Wednesday night, there was actually a child over in the corner that actually laughed when they saw this picture. It was great timing because it really is funny in a sense, isn't it? One person bonks the other person, the other one bonks the other person. I'll get you, you get me, back and forth and back and forth. And they're just being driven farther and farther and farther down in the ground. It's funny, but it's also sad, isn't it? Let's make sure that we don't do that as Christians to each other or to others outside of the church. That brings us to chapter 13. Are you ready for chapter 13? Are you ready with everything that you've seen? Are you ready to handle this chapter? Because it is going to stretch you. Get ready. Here we go. Verse 1, everyone must submit her, himself to the governing authorities. To who? The governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. And the Roman church would go, who? Not them guys. Not these guys. They do a lot of harm to people. You put those people in power? And we're to submit to them? People that sometimes take Christians and put them on stakes like that? We're supposed to submit to their authority? Told you. This chapter is going to stretch you. Let's bring it to our world. Who put these people in? According to the verse that we just read, who put these people in, in power? Uh, God did. Well, some people might say, well, I don't like those people. Okay. All right. Or I didn't vote for those people. 
Okay. What's the Bible say? God put them in. Here's an entire list, right? A whole bunch of people. Some of them you may have voted for. Some of them you may, you may not have voted for. Some of them you may have liked. Some may, may, may have, some of them you may have not liked in their policies. But who put them in? God. That's right. God did. Can I stretch your mind a little farther? What about this guy? I know he goes back a little bit. Do you remember Saddam Hussein? Did God also put this man into power? Read the verse again. How about this guy? Read the verse again. Oh, not that guy. <laughs> not Hitler. Read the verse again. This guy? How about Stalin? He probably killed more, had more people of his own people killed than Hitler did. Did God put these people in? Well, let's look at some others. How about King Nebuchadnezzar? Do you remember what King Nebuchadnezzar did in the book of Daniel? He took all the Israelites, ripped them out of Israel, and sent them into slavery after destroying the temple. And now they're over in Babylon. Did God put this guy in power? Well, read the book of Daniel, and that's exactly what it says. In fact, he had three whole chapters devoted to him. All of chapter 2, all of chapter 3, and all of chapter 4. All to him. In fact, this guy that did these things to the Israelites, in chapter 4, it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar. That means he is writing in the first person. It sounds like to me that he wrote part of our Bible. This guy that God put upon him. This guy that hauled the Jews into slavery. And then when the Babylonians are taken out, who takes them out? The Medo Persians. So the Medo Persians take them out and go and who gets who goes into power? Well, it was a co reign. It was Darius and Cyrus. Cyrus is prophesied in the book of Isaiah two hundred years before the guy's born. Mentioned by name. And what does God call him? My shepherd. He will accomplish what I desire. My shepherd. And what is he going to do in the book of Ezra? He's going to get all of these slaves, these Israelite slaves, that the Babylonians had. And he's going to tell them all, now that I got you guys, I'm going to send you back to Israel. And you can build a temple. And I'm even going to supply things so you can rebuild your, your, your temple. Huh. And why is that important? Because Jeremiah the prophet, who lived back there during the King Nebuchadnezzar, prophesied that in 70 years, Israel will come back to this place. And he fulfills that prophecy. In 70 years, he's going to fulfill it. But if you read anything else about King Cyrus, he wasn't a nice guy. And yet, this guy that's not so nice, God can still fulfill his purpose through him, the one that he put into power. Well, that stretches the brain a little bit, doesn't it? How about Pharaoh Nico? <laughs> he killed King uh, Josiah. King Josiah is one of the few good kings that the southern tribe of Israel had. And this guy kills him. Did God put him in place? That's what the Bible says. How about King Jeroboam? Right? Here's the nation of Israel. They are united. King Saul, King David, and King Solomon. United. But then everything just kind of broke apart and they divide. And now who's one of the kings? King Jeroboam. Not a nice guy. Who put him in place? God did. How about Moses? With the Pharaoh of Moses, right? One of those Pharaohs that dealt with Moses 
would take babies and put them in the Nile and be killed. Okay? But what does Moses' mom do? Saves her child. But this is the guy God put in power. Yeah. In fact, the other Mo, Pharaoh that Moses dealt with, he will tell him after he, when he goes after the Israelites and dies at the bottom of the Red Sea, he says that I will gain glory through you, Pharaoh. I'll be glorified through you. God was using this guy for his purpose. Interesting. How about the Pharaoh of Joseph? Joseph, right? Put into prison. He had a dream. Joseph interprets that dream. Right? Here comes the tribe, 12 tribes of Israel. They moved to Egypt. God put that guy in power. That's what the Bible says. How about Pontius Pilate? This is this is a guy that that helped have Jesus killed. Who put him in power? God did. Was God working through him though? Uh, his wife had a dream. His wife said, you shouldn't have anything to do with this guy. Stay away from him. He didn't listen. God was working. God put him in power. King Herod had the babies killed, right? In in, uh, in Bethlehem, two years and younger, trying to take out Jesus. Jesus had already escaped. Did God put him in power? He did. And then there's Caesar Claudius. Caesar Claudius. We're going to talk about him in a minute. So who, who puts these people in power? Jesus. God does. God puts these people in power. Let's look at Claudius for a minute. In chapter 18 of Acts, verse 1 and 2, it says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Have you heard of Priscilla and Aquila? They're pretty important people in the New Testament. Now watch what happened to these people. Because Claudius had, had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. He kicked them out. They used to live in Rome. Get out. And you go, man, that's bad. That's a bad thing for kicking people out, having them have to remove God's people, and he's moving them. Let me ask you this question. You already know the answer because I've given you some examples. Can God still bring about good things, even through bad leaders? Well, yeah, he can like the death of Jesus. But did good things come from that death? Yes. There was a resurrection. Payment of sins. Forgiveness of sins. Through Jesus. Good things. Through bad people. Let's talk about Claudius Caesar for a minute. He had several unattended effects on Christian history. First, his scattering of the Jews in Rome led directly to Paul's encounter with who? Priscilla and Aquila. Paul would have never ran into Priscilla and Aquila if they hadn't have been kicked out of Rome. Now, when this union happens, these two become faithful partners in Paul's gospel ministry, helping to establish several churches and guide the sincere but misguided Apollos. They actually help guide him in Acts 18. Go back and read that story. Second, if conflict over Jesus was the reason for the expo, 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 them being kicked out, I had a problem with that one yesterday. Sorry. My tongue gets tied. If that's the reason that Claudius kicked the Christians out was because they're Christians and, they're, and, and because of Jesus, Claudius inadvertently provided more historical evidence for the existence of Jesus and the spread of Christianity. He's actually helping to spread Christianity. 
In fact, finally, some of Paul's earliest letters were written under the reign of Claudius Caesar, so Claudius provided the political context for at least some of Paul's writings and travels, and God sovereignly used the reign of Claudius Caesar as he did uh, other Roman emperors to continue to spread the gospel of Jesus across the world. Can God still bring about good results with bad leaders? Yeah. Think about this guy named Saul of Tarsus. Do you remember him? He's going to become the Apostle Paul. What did Saul of Tarsus do? He went around killing Christians, right? Putting them in prison. What was Paul trying to do? What was his intent? His intent was to destroy everything that had to do with Jesus. Now turn the book of, to the book of Acts. It says because of this persecution that Saul of Tarsus was bringing, that forced all the Christians to flee Jerusalem because of this persecution. Terrible thing, isn't it? Ah, but is it? Because read the next verse. It's verse 4. When those Christians left, it says as they were scattered, they spread and taught the good news wherever they went. The church was stagnant. It was not moving. They were not fulfilling the gospel commission to take the gospel to all the world. So here comes persecution, and it moves them. And now the whole world is hearing about Jesus. So here's a bad event resulting in a good result. You see how that works? Can God bring about good? So here's Paul, Saul of Tarsus, thinking I'm going to destroy the church. And actually Saul of Tarsus is helping to spread the gospel. And then he converts. And then he goes out and preaches to the world. God can always bring good out of bad. And who's in control? He is. That's the point. That's the point. It doesn't matter who's in power. He can still get his purpose fulfilled. I told you this lesson is going to stretch you. So let's go back to Daniel. When Daniel here is, here's King Nebuchadnezzar. He's had a dream and it bothers him so much. And they bring in Daniel because he can interpret this dream. Watch what Daniel says. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. And then what does he say? He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise, knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what's in the darkness, and light dwells with him. Who? Who pulls out kings and raises them up? God does. How many of them? All of them. So he's in control, isn't he? He is. Now, what is Paul going to tell these Christians? Don't rebel. Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment it's hard isn't it don't rebel don't rebel rebellion refusal to accept authority defiance towards that's what rebellion is now let me throw a thought at you are there any exceptions well, let me give you one. You know who this lady is? This is Moses' mother. Now, she has went against the laws of the land. The law of the land was that all the male babies be killed in Egypt, up in Goshen. Uh, Moses' mother says, no, I'm going to save my child. Puts it in a basket. Puts him in a basket. Sends him down river. Saves his life. She actually went against what the king said. Here's an exception. Here's another one. Going back to the story here. 
When we get to the book of Revelation, speaking of the seven churches that live in the Roman Empire, okay, he tells them to be faithful unto death. Don't bow the knee to Caesar. You can submit to him, to his authority, but you don't worship him. And stay faithful unto death. I'll give you the crown of life. These people are refusing to to worship Caesar. Okay? So now you've got two groups of people, Moses' mom and these Christians, not doing what the government told them to do. So what's going on here, James? When a law of man violates God's laws, then we can and should do what God commands over what man commands. So if the government comes along and says, abort your babies, what was Moses' mother supposed to do? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what God says and try to do all I can to save my baby's life. When the government comes and says, you need to bow down and worship the president or the king or whoever it is. It's like, no, we're only supposed to bow the knee to Jesus. Then you do all you can to not bow down to Caesar. So when a law goes against God's laws, then we must follow God's laws. There is your balance. It's stretching, isn't it? It is. So don't fear. Don't fear. Verse 3 says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do you want to get to a place where you don't have to fear these authorities? Then do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Do good. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Do good. And there's that word, if. If. So if you do evil... In the Roman Empire, these guys are going to come and see you. If you do evil in our world, these guys are going to come and see you. We've got a couple of police officers in our congregation. we got Jason here. Wonderful guy. Great guy. We've got Abe over here. One of our members. Great guy. But if you want to drive your vehicle around, and you want to have all these drugs in it, these guys who are nice are going to take you to jail. <laughs> right? So if you don't want to be afraid of them, do what is good. And that's what Paul is telling the church in Rome. That's your balance. Always read the Bible within its content. Find the balance. Is this making sense? I hope so. I hope so. Therefore, verse 5, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. Conscience. Not just punishment, but conscience. So here's punishment, okay? Let's not do those things because we're going to get punished. Well, that's one motivator. But there's another motivator. Conscience. Because when we don't do what's right, what happens? It makes us feel guilty. So, if you want to not feel guilty, do what's right. Now, here we go. Look at the next verse. This is also why you pay taxes. Oh, taxes. Taxes. Are we going to talk about that today? For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to govern. What's Paul saying here? He's saying to pay your taxes. 
Pay your taxes. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. And honor to whom honor is owed. Pay what is owed. We have a hard time with this, right? It's like we don't want to let go of this. In fact, a lot of times it just seems like the government just takes and takes and takes and takes, and they do. And there's just more and more and more and more, and it's like it's never enough. But what's Jesus saying? Is he watching? He is. And what's he saying? Pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. But wait a minute. Do you not understand something, James? Do you not understand where some of our tax money goes to? Uh, this is one place. And what does this place support and push abortions? Well, James, didn't we just get done talking about how Moses saved the child? Here's an edict saying, hey, you've got to kill all these babies. Moses' mom goes against that and says, no, we're not going to do that. Well, then why should I pay taxes if my tax money is going to support something that is ungodly like abortions? Good question. Or why should I send tax money that will support this? This is a ballot voting on should we have gay marriage or not? Which God is against. My tax money supports this. So let's put this in balance. First of all, let's see what Jesus says about this subject. Let's go back to Matthew 22. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. So they brought him a denarii. And he asked them, whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? So they're trying to trap Jesus. Man, we got him. Are we supposed to pay taxes to Caesar or not? It's like, you're not going to be able to answer this right. Okay? If you say no, because it's used for evil, then you're going against the government. And if you say, yes, we should pay it, then you're going to look bad because this money is used for evil. We got them. So what does Jesus say? He said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar, and give to God what is God's. So what's Jesus saying? Then? Pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. So, how do we balance this? How do you balance that we're not supposed to partake in evil events that the government may say us for us to do? Okay, we're supposed to submit to them, but not when they go against God's laws. And at the same time, we're not supposed to do that, but we're supposed to pay our taxes. And some of our taxes go to things that are evil and go against God's laws. So how do we balance this? Let's see if you follow me here on this. Moses' mom was not going to put herself and involve herself in the sin of killing her baby. By being, paying taxes, you are not involving yourself. It's not like you're going and saying, okay, well, here's the law, so I'm going to go ahead and have a gay marriage. No, you're not involving yourself in that. You're not partaking in that sin. All you're doing is paying your taxes. And what they decide to do with that tax money, that's on them. And God will judge them for that. But you pay your taxes. Okay? You're not involving yourself with the sin. Does that make sense? Can you see the balance? So pay your taxes. But when, when God's laws are overridden by man's laws, do not participate in them. There's your balance. I told you it was going to stretch you. And you may not even like the answer. 
So now let's talk about our debt. Our debt to one another. So he's going to finish up with this. Let no debt remain outstanding, except for the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Love your fellow man. That's the debt that we owe. Our debt is to you and to each other that we love each other. Because that's what God did with us. He loved us enough to die for us. That's our debt. That's what the gospel should be bringing out of us. And if we have that, then we'll pay our taxes. We will submit to the authorities. We will pray for the authorities. That's love. The commandment, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's all summed up with this, right? So if I'm going to commit adultery, guess what? I'm not loving my neighbor because I'm sinning against my neighbor. And I'm sinning against God. That's not love. If I murder somebody, I'm not loving my neighbor because I killed them. That's not love. Or if I steal from my neighbor, cover from my neighbor, that's not love. God wants us to love our neighbor. Love. That's the key. That's what the gospel will bring out of us if we truly understand the gospel. And this isn't a New Testament thing. The Old Testament taught this. Leviticus chapter 19 says to love your neighbor as yourself. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So this was in the Old Testament too. It's in the law. This is what God has always wanted for man. And if you love your God and you love your neighbor, everything will be fulfilled that God wants from you. Think about it. Love does no harm to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Because you will do what God asks you to do if you love. If you love. Remember what Jesus says over here? To this Pharisee, right? He asks him, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, man, love love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. And Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, so actually, who is my neighbor? Right? Who is my neighbor? Look at all those faces in that picture. Who's my neighbor? What was the rest of the story about? It was the story of the Good Samaritan, right? Who is my neighbor? You are my neighbor. Everyone is my neighbor. And who am I supposed to love? Everyone. And that includes the government. I'm supposed to show them love and respect. Okay? As hard as that might be. Just like this guy. That this good Samaritan. He's laying here. He's all beat up. I'm going to go help him. Yeah, but he might try to jump me if I go over there. Or hear this. Or what about that? Or what's going to happen here? Love him. Love him. God will take care of the rest. And do this. Understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up. From your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer than it was when we first believed. And isn't our salvation nearer than when we first believed? Guys, we are one day closer to heaven than we were yesterday. We are getting closer to the goal. So wake up. Wake up from your slumber. And start putting what Paul is saying here into practice. Love each other. Love each other. Wake up. And you'll live. The night's nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us have decency as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness and sexual immorality and debauchery and 
dissension and jealousy. Let's not do those things. Not things of darkness, but things of light. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful flesh. All right? Clothe yourself with Christ. I'm going to leave us with this picture. God, take over my mind and fill it with you. And that's where the gospel should force us to go, to get to. This is where we're supposed to be. The gospel will stretch you. Get out of all that politics stuff. Don't worry about what's going on. God will take care of it. He always has. He's still in control. He is in total control. And he will see no matter what happens, even if we die as Christians and we're persecuted, thrown into jail, and have our heads cut off. God will still take care of it. And he will still see that his message gets proclaimed to this world. No matter who's in control, or how bad they are, or how good they are. He says this in Isaiah, My word shall not return to me void. It will accomplish what I desire. You ain't going to stop God. You ain't going to stop him. Satan tried to stop the seed line of Jesus at every point. He thought, man, at Noah's Ark, man, I have got him. God this is going to destroy the world, and it's over. <laughs> and God was like, Jesus is on that ark. His seed line is on there. He's coming and you can't stop him coming. No matter what you do, Satan, you can't stop God's plan. So church, trust him. I hope you've been blessed by this lesson today. It was a deep one. It was a good one. Paul's really stretching our minds here. Don't forget to come back next week. It's going to be an important lesson. We're going to talk about disputable matters. Romans chapter 14. That's going to be a doozy. You be blessed, church. I hope you come back and put a like on these videos and subscribe to my YouTube channel. They're just below here. If you'll do that, these mess this message will get out to other people. I love you. I do these lessons because I love you. May God bless you. We'll see you next time.